Hi, I'm Ant Murphy. I'm a product coach and the founder of Product Pathways. And what I want to take you through now is my product discovery kickoff workshop board. This is a mirror board and a template that you can use. Uh, and this is my approach to kicking off product discovery. I've coached countless product managers on this now. I've helped companies implement very similar, if not the same kickoff discovery process. And this is all about bringing in the core team and stakeholders, building a shared alignment and a shared understanding and basically aligning before we go and kick off any type of big discovery um, piece of work. So on that note, I wanna just start with orientating you on this board so you understand what's going on. And then we're gonna walk through the process. I'm gonna to explain to you each of the steps and how that works uh, and give you some more information on that. So just in a way of introduction and orientation, you'll see two versions of the same thing. And you'll probably notice that as the name denotes, along the top, this is a worked example. So along the bottom is a blank version of it. If I can zoom in properly. Um, so down the bottom here is a blank version. And then along the top is a worked version with some actual information inside of it and what this can actually look like. So feel free to copy the blank version into a new template or delete the worked version or just leave it. But the worked version is there to help you see what this can look like in real life and help you be able to get inspiration from it and hopefully just explain it a little bit better. The next thing we have is just a little bit of an intro and this video is going to end up there. And it's got a proposed agenda. So you can see that this kickoff workshop typically takes about two hours to do. Um, it can take a little bit shorter if it's a smaller discovery thing or if there's more alignment and more understanding on what the discovery, um, the opportunity is that we're doing discovery on. It can also take longer if we don't know or if we or if it's a bigger opportunity, if there's more unknowns or just generally if we want to spend more time having conversations on any aspects within the workshop. The workshop kicks off with a summary and just a, you know, the context of what the opportunity is. This doesn't actually exist in the board. The board kind of kicks off from here with the problem statement. Now, the reason for that is we want to just kick off by giving everybody the context of what is this opportunity? Why does it matter? Or what are we actually doing? Those types of things. Uh, and it doesn't exist in this board because we probably have all of those things packaged up outside of, you know, here. So what you might be doing here is walking the team or the group through the opportunity canvas or maybe a one pager or an opportunity assessment that you've already done, or even just general context about the landscape of why this opportunity or this problem space has come about. So any information you have, you know, invite other stakeholders to talk about it, but that's what you want to kick this workshop off with. You want to just get everybody on the same page and understanding the background and the context. From there, we dive into the first activity and I'll go through the worked example here when I talk about it. And all what this is all about is about framing the problem. So you would have given the context and you would have explained the problem statement already as part of that. And I've got a spot here for you to add the actual problem statement. Now, what we wanna do is just get everybody across the problem. Why, what is the problem? Why does it exist? You know, frame the problem. But I also like to create space and I think it's just good practice to do this to create space to be able to reframe the problem statement. Now, the reason for this is often what I've experienced personally is when we've taken everybody through the context, we're taking everybody through the problem statement, there's a whole bunch of questions. And sometimes through, in fact, quite often through answering those questions, we actually realize that the problem statement needs a little bit of tweaking. So what I think is good practice and what I generally do is I create the space to just be able to reframe the problem statement. Like, do we need to make adjustments? Is the problem statement correct? What do we want to change? And this is important to kick discovery off with is because if we're not all aligned on what the problem statement is, if we haven't made those tweaks, then we're going to run into those questions and those issues later on. So we wanna, you know, first up, we wanna create alignment on the problem. Now there's an activity here, which is known as abstract laddering as a technique. Uh, and there's a just a space to do an abstract ladder here. 
Um, I also think this is good practice, even if you don't feel as though the problem statement needs to be reframed. I think it's a really good practice. I like to do this. I pretty much always do this. I will basically take the problem statement two layers up the ladder and then two layers down the ladder. So for those who don't know, you can read a bit more about abstract ladder in here. I've got a bit of an example. Um, you can also Google about it. I think there's no, no link, but you can Google it as well. But the way that abstract ladder in works is we take the initial problem statement and then we make it more abstract. So we move up the ladder, we make it broader and wider. And then moving down the ladder is to make it more narrow and more concrete. So as we move up, we get more into the, the why and the what. And as you move down, you get more into the how. So we get more concrete. Now, this is just good practice to do because sometimes uh, once we've done this and what we're doing is we're basically taking a few steps back and then looking at the problem statement, we're looking at broader problem statements, we're looking at more narrow problem statements. And when we do this, we can then ask ourselves, are we framing the problem at the right level of fidelity? Like, is this the right level of fidelity? Or should we pick maybe one of the ones that are more abstract? Or should we pick one that's more concrete? And, and this is why I think it's a really good practice. And this happens to me all the time. We do this activity and we realize, oh, you know what? This is actually too broad. We need to make it more concrete. Or we realize it's actually too concrete. We need to make it more broad. Uh, so just a really good activity to do. And again, this is the first activity because we need to align everyone on that problem, on that problem statement before we really do anything in terms of discovery and anything in terms of this workshop. So the next activity we then go into, seems a bit like a strange one, but I'll explain why, is a stakeholder map. Now you might be wondering why not do the stakeholder map first or last, or um, you know why not do it before the problem statement? Because then the problem statement flows nicely into the next activity, which is assumptions mapping, which we'll get to. Now, the reason for that is my experience has been when we walk into these workshops, everyone is itching to talk about the problem. Everyone's itching to ask questions about the problem and learn about it. So the times that I've tried to do something else like the stakeholder map and do some other clarity exercises before doing the problem statement, I've always found that to be challenging because people just want to talk about the problem statement. What I have found over the years as a more logical flow or a, a more natural flow, I should say, is to talk about the problem statement first. We can just get that out of the way. Talk about it, align on the problem statement, ask questions about it, get that out of the way. Once we've done that, people feel more comfortable and we can then create the space for other activities like a stakeholder map. Now, why do I include a stakeholder map? Because this workshop could run without a stakeholder map and feel free to remove it if you don't think it's relevant. The reason why I do include this stakeholder map here is because um, I often do this as a collaborative exercise, and I think that's a really good practice. So include your stakeholders, include you know the extended team, those types of things. And because we have everybody in the room, it's a really powerful time to actually clarify our roles and responsibility for discovery. So this is one of my favorite stakeholder mapping techniques. I love it because it's just so simple. And the way that it works here, and the way that I would use it in this context is the middle is the core team. So who are the core people who are going to be on discovery? So this is a great opportunity to clarify, like, are you part of the core team? And this is the expectations if you are part of the core team. You need to be at every workshop. You gotta be at our discovery standoffs. You gotta be, you know, there for user interviews, those types of things. Or are you going to be a direct stakeholder? Which are the stakeholders that we will highly collaborate, collaborate with we will consult, we will bring in at moments that make sense, and um, we'll have frequent engagement with, but you don't need to be there for every workshop. You'll be engaged, you'll be consulted when it makes sense, but you're not, you're not the core team. And then finally, we have indirect stakeholders, which are those who are like, you know what? You don't need to collaborate with me. You don't need to consult with me. I just wanna be kept in the loop about what's going on and what's happening. And that's our indirect stakeholders, which we would just communicate with and doing this collaboratively can help us have those conversations. Uh, often I ask them to put where they think they are in the stakeholder map, and then for them to add any stakeholders we think are missing. And this is just great to work out, do we, do we have alignment and clarity on who the core team is? 
Do we have alignment and clarity on who our direct stakeholders are, those people we're going to consult, we're going to collaborate with? Are we missing key people? And then who are those people that are indirect stakeholders who we are going to make sure that we're, you know, doing regular communication with and involving them when necessary? So this activity is really powerful just to create alignment on those things, clarifies roles and responsibilities a little bit, and just really works out who's who in the zoo and who do we need to, you know, consult and who do we need to communicate with. So I think it's a really good activity uh, and it's why I always include it. The next step inside all of that is we go back to the problem space and back to like, you know, the core of discovery and we do an assumptions map. Now assumptions mapping as a technique comes from David Bland and the book from Strategizer, Testing Business Ideas, or at least that's where I learned it from. And essentially the way that this works is we map out all the assumptions we're making about this opportunity and we plot it against a two by two matrix. So the way that this two by two matrix works is we have the Y axis, which is all about importance. So we have things at the top, which is high importance. So these are things that are highly important to this opportunity. In other words, if we were wrong about this assumption, like the whole idea falls apart, like the opportunity just wouldn't exist. And then we have things that are low. So there are assumptions that, you know, if they were true or not, won't necessarily have a major impact on the opportunity. And then we have evidence on the x-axis. So we have things with no evidence or little evidence on that side. And then we have evidence on the other side. So just to give you an example, and this is the one I use in my training and when I coach this and train this, imagine you are Uber and the person who came up with Uber, the brilliant idea, you're sitting in your garage, you're like, boom, collaborative consumption. Yeah, Uber, like we can, we can do this. A assumption that you might be making about the idea would be that people would be willing to get into strangers' cars. Now, I would put that as high importance. Why? Because if people aren't willing to get into strangers' cars, the whole idea falls apart, right? Like it won't work. It just won't work. So it is integral to the idea. Now, I would also put it on the side of little to no evidence because whilst we have cab cabs cabs have a brand they have a license they you know those types of things um maybe we could talk to some hitchhikers those types of things but there's there's low evidence on it now on the flip side you might have an assumption that is we can track you know the drivers in real time and we can work out where they are and give an eta those types of things now that would be low importance because if we can't do that the idea doesn't fall apart Yes, the user experience won't be as nice as it is if we could do that, but it's not integral to the success of the opportunity. I would also put it down here on the evidence side because we have, you know, navigation apps, Google Maps existed back then, those types of things. There is substantial evidence to support that, hey, we could actually do this, but an assumption nonetheless. So what we would do is we'll map out our assumptions. Now, feel free to, you know, David Bland runs assumptions mapping a training. You feel free to take them, read, read the book, um, read his blog, read more about assumptions mapping. Um, I don't do assumptions mapping exactly how he teaches it. I actually just like to brainstorm all or any, all in any assumptions you're having, right? Just put them down on the matrix, put them relative to each other's, don't overthink it. Uh, and again, like I said, don't overthink it. It's just meant to be relative. So what it means is that this is more important than this and this one is more important than this one but this one we have less evidence on than the, these two and th but these two we have more evidence on than than this one so just do it relative doesn't mean that you know x amount of evidence or anything like that it's just all relative also means that one assumptions map is hard to compare to another because it's relative to what's on the map so we want to map out all of our assumptions. We want to put it against this matrix. And we want to do that because what this is going to do is give us not just our initial discovery backlog, like what are we going to do discovery on? The answer is we're going to do discovery on these assumptions. It's also going to give us guidance on prioritization. So the next step is to then take our assumptions map and prioritize it. And the way that you prioritize it is the things in the top right-hand quarter as denoted here so your high important assumptions with little to no evidence 
are your riskiest assumptions. They are the ones that you have the greatest risks on. And we all know that we should be just doing discovery on our riskiest assumptions. Now, this doesn't mean you don't end up doing discovery on the other items. It all is a time equation, right? We're going to prioritize it. Once we get through these assumptions, then yeah, of course, we'll work our way through the rest of the map. But I'll get to kind of a time boxing in a minute, but we don't always do discovery on everything there because like discovery could then go for weeks and weeks and months and months and months, and we don't want that either. So the next step in all of that is to take those assumptions, take the ones that are the riskiest and create a discovery backlog, like list them out here. What I then like to do is put the laser, like a lens of what type of risk is it? Is it a desirability risk, a viability risk, a usability risk, a feasibility risk? And then as a group, we need to start to brainstorm, how might we test this? So we have this risk, you know, people, you know, we're, we're assuming that people have um, a challenge around saving enough for a deposit on a new home. That's a desirability risk. Because, you know, if this is a challenge, then this will motivate them to want something, an alternative that's going to help them. And how might we test this? Well, we could run surveys. We could ask recent first home buyers or people looking to buy their first home, you know, about the challenges that they have. We could interview people. We could actually ask the questions face to face. We could do card sorting activities with them about, you know, what are your biggest challenges with buying a first home and get them to, you know, rank things. There are and almost an infinite number of ways that you can test um, assumptions and ideas. But what we want to do is just brainstorm some of those activities because this is what we ultimately are going to have to do in discovery. Discovery is all about de-risking and building confidence. And it's all about, you know, working out what do we need to gain confidence on and what do we need to de-risk on? And the answer to that is what assumptions are you making about the opportunity? and then working out how you might test that assumption and get more information and data on it. That is the core of discovery. If you need some help around, you know, how you might um, test this, as people often do, I created a little bit of a cheat sheet. Um, and the idea behind this is it's not meant to be perfect. It's not meant to be exhaustive, but this is just some categories around different types of risk and some of the activities you might do to test things that have that type of risk. For example, you know, prototyping, A-B testing, user testing is much more around usability, less about things like viability, but, you know, and market analysis is much more about viability, doesn't really help you test usability as an example. But this is just meant to be a cheat sheet, a guide. It's not meant to be exhaustive, but I developed this to help people like you, because um, they kind of really struggle with trying to understand, well, what are ways that I can test this? Well, just use this as a reference. It should get you thinking and asking the right questions. And hopefully you can come up with something and some way to test it. That's really the intent. Um, that's why I included it in here. So I thought it would be useful at this step. So now we have an initial discovery backlog. We have a prioritized list of assumptions. We have, you know, what type of risk is it? And what are some of the ways we might actually go about testing it? And those things can be like your backlog items that you're actually going to pull in and actually go and do, right? The next step is, and the final step or second final step, because the last step is next steps. Um, but the final step you want to do here is to come up with a time box on discovery. Now, I think this is really good practice to do. And a common observation I make, because I get to see the inside of many different companies, is that stakeholders aren't the biggest fan of discovery. And when I start to unpack why, a lot of it's based on their own assumptions and preconceived notions, and maybe even their own experiences or previous experiences around discovery. And a common thing that I hear and I observe is that discovery takes too long and it goes on for too long. And that discovery feels like a black box to them. You know, the team's telling them that they need to do discovery and they kind of understand the concept and why that's important, but they don't know what's happening. What are they actually doing discovery on? Like, what are they actually researching? And they also feel like it goes on for far too long and they don't have any visibility onto like, when does discovery, you know, start and end? So a simple hack to solve that, and I just think this is good practice in general, um, is to create a time box. So the time box, and again, if you do this collaboratively, you're going to have the stakeholders there and everything, and you're going to have a healthy discussion about 
how long we should spend on discovery. And this is going to help give them that clarity to say, hey, we're not, we're not actually going to spend the next three months doing discovery on this. We're actually just going to do four weeks. That's, that's all we feel like we need to do. And then they're like, oh yeah, four weeks, I'm cool with that. So you're creating that alignment and you're helping them give that visibility. And you know, a lot of that uncertainty goes away and they're like, oh yeah, four weeks, four weeks sounds reasonable and they're okay with that. Now, another reason why I say this is just good practice is because we can do discovery forever. There is always more things you can learn. There's always more data you can get. There's always more you can validate. And you know, discovery can just become an endless activity and it sometimes does in organizations. So we want to avoid that because really at some point there's diminishing returns in getting more information and more, you know, more data and more research. Um, there's a lot of value in research early on and then it starts to taper off. So what we want to do is find that sweet spot between how much information we need to get and how much, you know, how much risk is there and how much comfort, like how much confidence do we need to gain in this idea before we actually decide to build it versus how much time we actually spend on it. So I learned this um, from a colleague and this was how I learned discovery. So I was very fortunate that I got introduced to this very early in my career. Many years later, about four years ago, maybe five now, I took Jeff Patton's Passionate Product Leadership course and I discovered that he got it from Jeff Patton and it's something that Jeff Patton teaches. Um, but essentially what it is, is that we ask ourselves, like how much confidence do we have or how much evidence do we have on the idea or how risky is the idea? And there's a relationship between obviously like more risk equals low confidence, less evidence equals low confidence, which means more time should be spent on discovery versus there's gonna be other ideas that are very low risk. Maybe we got a lot of evidence and data already and we have high confidence in it. In that case, we can spend less time on discovery and that's okay because even after we do discovery, we're gonna build it in an iterative fashion. We're gonna do an MVP. We're still gonna de-risk. We're still gonna do activities to de-risk afterwards. So it's okay. Doesn't need to be perfect. Again, diminishing value. If you've got high confidence in it and it's low risk and you go and spend 10 weeks on discovery, that's probably eight plus weeks wasted, right? Versus the inverse is also true, which is we have low confidence, it's high risk and you know, stakeholders are like, just build it, ship it also bad and also risky. So this matrix is just here to help you have that conversation with the stakeholders, to have a conversation as a team and to set a time box. Now, one last thing on the time box, because everyone freaks out about this point. They say, well, what happens if we still don't have enough confidence at the end of four weeks, we'll take four weeks to proceed with the idea? Well, that's okay. View the time box as just a stake in the ground. It's a stake in the ground to stop us from spending four months on discovery. But if at the end of the four weeks, we learned a bunch of information and really our confidence decreased because we learned, oh my God, there's so much more for us to learn about this. Like, you know, we're just scratching the surface. Then that's okay as well. The confidence has shifted, the risk has shifted. Now we can also do another time box, but it'll be best to set another time box. Do we need another two weeks on this? Do we need another four weeks on this? What is it? Set another time box, do that time box, again, stake in the ground. This also means that the opposite can happen as well. And I've been there. We did a six week discovery for a client when I was working um, at us two, and we were partially through it. And we were realizing that the viability was really low and that we had low confidence that this was actually a viable idea and we ended discovery early right? So the opposite can also be true. You can end discovery early. You don't need to fill that time box. You could get two weeks into that four weeks and realize, hey, this idea doesn't have legs. Let's just can it um, and move on to the next thing. So opposite is also true. But that's it. So set a time box. Again, really important to do this collaboratively. You can align stakeholders, just, just great activity for that. You also find, at least in my experience, that stakeholders will be more comfortable with discovery when you start to do this practice. And then finally, last one is next steps, bringing the workshop to a close, doing a conclusion, doing a recap, capturing any action items, capturing any next steps, and just making sure we close um, the workshop. So that's it. That is how I kick off discovery. And that is the discovery kickoff workshop here. Remember, start with the context, 
start with explaining the opportunity, walk through an opportunity canvas or whatever you have, a one page or a confluence page, whatever. Frame the problem statement, invest some time into reframing the problem statement if necessary. Do a stakeholder map, create alignment on who's the core team, who's not. Do an assumptions map. This should really be where the bulk of your time should be spent on the assumptions mapping exercise. Map out those assumptions. Use it to create a prioritized list of your, dis your initial discovery backlog. What assumptions do you need to test? How might you test them? And then set a time box. And that's really kicking off discovery because what you've done is you've got clarity on the opportunity and the problem statement. You've got clarity on who's doing what. You have clarity on your initial backlog, like what are you doing discovery on? And then you have a time box and you can just go ahead from there. So really good practice to go through all that. I hope you found that valuable. I hope you can put this template to good use. I know many product managers are using it today and several companies are as well that I helped them implement this. If you have any further questions on product discovery or anything, feel free to reach out, throw them in the comments below, happy to answer them. And a product discovery course is going to be coming out soon on Product Pathways as well. I'm in the middle of working on the next course, which is product strategy. And then the course after that will be product discovery. So more on product discovery um, to come. If you're watching this video later in the future, maybe that course is already out by then. If it is, check out the comments below. I, I would pin the comment with a link to it. I will do that. Um, so if you see that, it's already out by then. And I'll just leave you on that one as usual. Thanks for all the support. Thanks for all the help. And I'll see you at the next one.